Welcome to History 112, Lecture 25, The Hoover Presidency. How we remember the Hoover presidency is very much framed by what happens immediately after he leaves office, because the American people generally regarded Hoover as being useless as president, and FDR who follows him is going to take the country in a very radically different direction than what Hoover had. The Republican domination government is going to end, socialism and communism had failed to become a major force in the American politics, but at the same time the left becomes respectable, and the power of the federal government is going to greatly increase due to something called the New Deal, we'll talk about in a subsequent lecture, and that's going to bring in large numbers of artists and intellectuals, and even the most severe critics of capitals are now going to come into government, and people are going to begin to see the government's agent of positive change and that's all what happens after Hoover on the other hand is going to be seen as someone who did very little who allowed the Great Depression to happen when people wanted to blame someone it's going to be Hoover and we remember him very negatively in part because of that contrast with FDR who follows him and takes the country in a completely different path Herbert Hoover had been in office just under a year when the stock market crash hit. Now, Hoover's philosophy for his response was limited government individualism. The initial response with Herbert Hoover is an attempt to restore confidence, not by taking any action, but by giving speeches. He's going to ask companies and unions to voluntarily forego forego pay raises and layoffs in order to keep people working, so he's going to ask unions to work for the lowest wages possible and in exchange for the employers not to fire anybody. Now he is going to eventually bring in public works programs towards the end of his presidency, but that's but it's a big increase over previous presidents. But in the context of the Great Depression, what Hoover brings in is merely a band-aid on a gunshot wound, so to speak. It's not anything that's going to stem the tide that's already in place. Now, he is going to insist that states do the same and that states should lead the recovery program through engaging in public works, but most states during Hoover's presidency are desperately fending off bankruptcy themselves. Now, Hoover's main area of concentration was in trying to stabilize grain prices, which was an important issue. Now, by 1931, Hoover was deeply unpopular. He tried to convince the nation that there was a brief improvement that year, and this is proof that his policies were working. But at the same time, a lot of people were living in impoverished shanty towns that became known as Hoovervilles. And the Democrats are going to win a majority in the House and many seats in the Senate during midterm elections, and the Democrats start promising increased government intervention in the economy. Here's a simple example of a Hooverville in New York City. As we can see, it's an empty lot where you see just shacks that have sort of been improvised, and large numbers of people lived in those types of conditions because they had been evicted. They were homeless. This is what a lot of people have been reduced to. So the Herbert Hoover narrative of everything will get better in a second really wasn't resonating with people who had to live in these circumstances. Now, protests against Hoover were very common. Farmers, for example, formed the Farmers Holiday Association, and they wanted to withhold food from the market in protest of falling prices. There's also the Bonus Expeditionary Force, where World War I soldiers are going to march on Washington. Now, the Bonus March was probably the biggest protest of Hoover's era. World War I vets had been entitled to a $1,000 bonus payable in 1945, and a lot of these vets were unemployed and were asking for their money to be paid immediately. Not even necessarily all of it, just some cash advance on this money that they were eventually supposed to get from the government. Now, Hoover is going to reject this demand because the government is insisting on having a balanced budget. As a result of them rejecting the demand for receiving some of the money they were owed immediately, 20,000 veterans marched on Washington and built improvised camps. And here we see them sleeping on the lawn out in front of the Capitol in Washington, D.C. Hoover felt that having homeless veterans sleeping on the steps of the Capitol just in the run-up to an election was an embarrassment. And after a minor confrontation between marchers and police, Hoover decides to send in the army to clear them out. Douglas MacArthur, who had been one of the more decorated soldiers of World War I and is going to become a major World War II general, sends in a large force. He sends in about a thousand men on horses, a couple of thousand infantrymen, some machine guns, and some tanks. Now what they're going to do is they're going to chase the marchers out of Washington, D.C. and burn their camps. Many marchers are going to be injured, and as a result of what happened here, this is going to destroy what public support was left for Herbert Hoover. Also, towards the end of Hoover's presidency, he is going to attempt to create what's called the Reconstruction Finance Corporation, and it's a measure designed to bail out troubled companies with federal loans. And it's also going to include measures to help failing banks and help people avoid foreclosure. And this all comes too late at the, at the end of 1931. So we're three years into the Depression, when public support is almost gone. People see this one final attempt to do something about the Great Depression as a, just a bid to hold on to the end of his term.
But when we look at it from a sort of more modern point of view, Hoover's response would be seen to be a little different. See, Hoover is reluctant to spend large amounts of federal funds and expand the role of the federal government. He is working off the precedent of the presidents that came before him. He is working off a theory of extremely limited government, which had been the way the country had run for over a century. Now, Hoover is willing to intervene in the economy in an unprecedented degree when compared to his predecessors. However, he, this unprecedented degree is still inadequate to meet the challenge that he had. Hoover, we have to understand, has the bad luck to be president during the worst disaster, economically speaking, of American history. And he is a man that cannot deal with this crisis at a time when almost no one could. So we judge Hoover, we should be careful not to judge him too harshly. Now we have to remember that not everyone is going to look at it that way at the time, and most Americans blame Hoover for the crisis. So when the 1932 election kicks off, the Democrats put forward Franklin D. Roosevelt, who was a candidate who was very much in favor of strong government intervention, and offered a package of reforms that he referred to as the New Deal. And the New Deal is an extensive plan of government intervention that we'll talk about in a subsequent lecture. Now, Republicans, on the other hand, are going to nominate Hoover for a second term. The atmosphere at the Republican convention indicated that few believe Hoover had any real chance of victory, and Hoover is going to campaign on things like the worst is past, prosperity is just around the corner. Few people took him seriously. He offered no solution and just told the country, wait and see. Meanwhile, Franklin D. Roosevelt is campaigning, promising various solutions. He talks about he is going to intervene in the banks, and he is going to intervene in the economy. He doesn't give a lot of details, but... Unlike Hoover, who promised the worst is past, FDR is going to come in and say and swear to the American people he's going to make sure, as he put it, there's a chicken in every pot. Now, as we can see here, there's two different ways to look at this election. On the right-hand side on that map, we see that how each state voted. And what we can see is that almost every state voted for Roosevelt. He takes 472 electoral votes to 59. So we see a very small amount of blue on that map. On the other hand, if we look at the map on the left, we look at states that switch from voting Republican to Democrat. So we see is there's a big realignment in party voting preference that is brought on by the Great Depression. And the Great Depression is ultimately going to kick off a political realignment in the country that's going to take a few years to settle down. And we'll talk about that a little more when we get to kind of the mid-century and the way that the two political parties begin to switch positions. Now, once the election results are in, what's known as the lame duck period begins. That's November 1932 to March of 1933. Now, by tradition, the outgoing president does next to nothing once the election is lost. They make no new policy. They make no new great departures. They just maintain the status quo. Their job, in effect, is just to keep the seat warm until the new president can take office. Now, in February 1932, a major problem arises towards the end of this period. There's a giant banking crisis, and Hoover does nothing, because that's what tradition dictates. And he lets the crisis grow until FDR takes office. Now, FDR has to come with a very strong response to this crisis, which he does, which will be a subject for another lecture. But the thing is, everyone realizes that this weak response during this time period is problematic, and that leads to the 20th Amendment to the Constitution. And we're going to shorten the time between the election and inauguration from 15 weeks down to 7. Now, now here we have a picture from the inauguration day with Her Herbert Hoover, the outgoing president, riding with Franklin D. Roosevelt, the about-to-be sworn-in president. And this picture really kind of comes right at the end of Hoover's presidency. And the New Yorker, a very famous magazine, captures the mood of the day and the mood of both candidates very aptly with this drawing. And here we get right down to it. Here's Roosevelt, gleaming, ready to look forward to the future to deal with the crisis, where poor Hoover, no matter what he's done, all he's gotten is the blame. And nothing he can do makes any difference anymore. So what's the big idea? Well, Hoover does very little, and he's blamed for what he does, and then he's blamed for what he doesn't do. Hoover's problem is he sees the role of the president as being very limited, but he is willing to do more than many of his predecessors still would have. But what he's doing is still ineffective, because this circumstance is so far beyond anything anyone's ever conceived of before that only a radical response is going to make any difference. Now, FDR, unfortunately for Hoover, comes in and advocates just that. He advocates with breaking with all tradition by offering massive government government intervention. And that's going to be a subject of some subsequent lectures when we talk about the New Deal. See you in the next lecture.